let's let's start here. Stacy, welcome to the show. We appreciate you. Thanks for joining us. I want to start with you. What's your biggest takeaway, Stacy, from this past season? Uh, just kind of a roller coaster, you know, up and down. You know, you get excited. Uh, you know, uh, you get excited some games, and in other games, you go, "Wow, I can't believe we just beat this good team!" And then we turned around and you lost to a team that we probably should have lost to. Um, just the inconsistency, you know. I mean, this team, I believe, and I still believe this, and I'm, I, I think I heard our tourists talk about it too. Is this team I felt was better than this record? I know it didn't end that way, but I thought with you know three All Star caliber players on your roster and then some budding young players coming up, you know, I know we lost Lonzo and he was gone the whole season and that made a huge difference uh, at the point guard position. But I, I thought this team was was much better on paper than what it ended up. What about you, Jay? When you think about this season, how how does it pan out for you? A disappointment, much to what Stacey spoke to. You know, this team is uh, talented enough to not be in the playing situation and then have the playing come around. And, you know, the way they played post All-Star break, uh, and I know they played some teams that were tanking at the end, right? So 14 and 9 is what our tourist car show was brought up in terms of being on the right path. But, um, you know, you've seen this group play together without Lonzo. So Lonzo is kind of the outlier. That that segment of Bulls basketball for me over the last couple of years was the outlier. I think we got enough data on um, the the way that this roster was put together and the shooting that was necessary that wasn't there in certain moments. I mean, this team played hellacious defense after the first of the year, but offensively for them to not have – the, uh, the the kind of consistency that you expected with the amount of firepower they had. It just it, this seemed like there was disconnections throughout the season and recognition issues throughout the season. So it was disappointing, disappointing for sure. What about you, Bill? They speak the truth. <laughs> and, and, and the simple answer is, just, let's look at the last two games that the Bulls played. Yeah. We played the, the second half of Toronto, absolutely outstanding. You had a uh, Jordan-esque Type finish by Zach Levine. Bulls come back and <clears throat> and win a, a big game. Huge. The last five minutes, especially the last two minutes of the Miami game, what team is that? And that's the inconsistencies and the roller coasters that you have. <clears throat> Honestly, calling that game in Miami was exciting because the way the Bulls played, it got in, the energy was there. It was a real playoff atmosphere. But the last you know, four minutes, you're starting to, uh-oh, things are bad. And then the last minute you're like what's going on is this the first time you guys played together because you're throwing the ball out of bounds you're creating turnovers and it was just that type of season where they showed you some things that really looked good and you were excited about the possibilities but then it just was not consistent enough i mean we're talking about a team that never won four games in a row yeah. And you beat some really good teams and had some great efforts to, uh, on the floor, but you just couldn't put it together consistently. Well, and I want to go around the horn and ask you all, when it came to even seeing what you saw in the game, I think the game is the best way to analyze this. How many times to see this season as a collective, Stacy, Jason, Bill, did we see them go away from what seemed like an established game plan, like play themselves out of leads and – you saw it a little bit in this last game, and I feel like we can talk about it more because AK himself brought up shot selection. So I'll mix it up, and I'll start with you, Jason. I know you're nodding, and then, of course, Stacey. Well, that's all. the recognition part for me throughout the season. Um, you know, there were there were times, and, and I don't know how to uh, better phrase this, but there were times throughout the season where it seemed like the Bulls asked the game, not only how hard do I have to play, but how long do I have to play the right way? And once the, the 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 game gave them the the answer that was sufficient, it was like, okay, now it's time to <laughs> now it's time to get whatever that you had in the bag off, and and that discipline and that lack of recognition. I mean, it's the difference between messing around and being the fourth seed, and or messing around and being the tenth seed, and we saw it all year long. So um, it, it's the, the the sacrifices that maybe were needed throughout a game or throughout a quarter. We just didn't see them consistently enough. And then when you do see these winning time teams, uh, like like Bill mentioned, you beat the, the the Celtics of the world and the Milwaukee Bucks of the world and those types of teams during the regular season. But when we see these teams play in this period, where it's postseason, you have you see these teams 
execute on a level that two or three possessions will get you blown out of a game. I mean, you, you watch that Phoenix Suns uh, LA Clippers game and the Suns, Devin Booker's out there playing hellacious defense. And the one time that they let up, all of a sudden Kawhi Leonard starts to get it going. And next thing you know, he's on a, he's on an eight Oh run by himself. I mean, those are the little moments in a regular season where you watch the bulls ignore their option in, in Vooch for a couple of, maybe a couple of quarters, maybe a couple of possessions, and it just turns the game because you don't have the margin for error. So just the recognition piece, I think, was, is most important in terms of the inconsistency part. Stacy, you've talked a lot about this this season. You've talked about playing offense through Vooch and how the Bulls, sometimes when they do it, they look incredible doing it, and then they get away from it. How, how does that happen, and, and why does it continuously happen with this Bulls team where they are doing something really well and then they stop doing it? Well, I mean, you know, it comes down to situational awareness. Um, we call it basketball IQ, you know, understanding, you know, what you need in that particular trip down the floor or what we need in this particular possession, you know, that's important down the last two minutes of the game. Do we need a three-point shot or do we get a higher percentage shot with our big guy hope for a double team and then be ready to spot up and shoot. You know, Zach Levine is one of the best spot up shooters in the NBA. I mean, he's on the lines of Clay Thompson and Steph Curry as far as spot up shooting. And that's one of his strengths that he doesn't really like to use. But when you see him in a game with a catch and shoot situation, it's almost automatic. He makes that shot. So why wouldn't you put that ball down into Vooch? And Vooch is a willing passer. I get mad at Vooch when he passed the ball out when he's three feet away from the basket <laughs> and he's trying to do a jump hook. I'm like, oh, my God, and he throws it to someone who's not a good three-point shooter. Uh, you know, it, it comes down to situational awareness. It's not just with Zach or DeMar. Vooch, too. Vooch has to understand that he, in my opinion, I see him every night. I think he has – some of the best post moves in the NBA as far as big guys are concerned. I would put him back to the basket as probably one of the best guys with Embiid and Jokic. And I would even say, I would say he's behind Embiid as far as, you know, back to the basket moves. He's got great footwork. He can score with either hand. So my question is, why wouldn't you take advantage of that? And plus, he's a former all-star. And there was, games in that, there was a time in that Miami game where the Bulls struggled in the fourth quarter scoring. When you're having a hard time scoring, that's when you utilize the big man. That's when you say, hey, wait a minute, we can get easier shots with Vooch. Let's throw the ball in there to him. He's killing Bam. Bam wasn't really doing anything, you know, on the offensive end. He was rebounding the basketball because there was a lot of shots. But, he, I mean, he scored on every big man in this yeah. league. I mean, and it made it look very easily. I don't know why they did. They go away from that. I, I just don't. I scratch my head sometimes, and I always say it's a simple game. You get the ball to the big fella. Let him let him eat some. He's going to make your job a lot easier. He's going to set better screens. You know, he's going to run the court harder when he knows. Bill will tell you, you know, big guys, we played with Michael Jordan. We didn't get to touch the ball a lot. But when we touched that ball, we were very efficient when we got a chance to score. And that's what I feel like they got away from with Booch a little bit. Yeah, I agree 100%. But part of it, it, what I think is, and I don't like to say this because I don't mean it as disparaging disparagingly as it sounds is we are who we are hundred percent. And when the pressure gets tough and you get a little bit tired, you do what you do. And DeMar and Zach got to where they are because they're outstanding, not good, outstanding one-on-one -on -one basketball players. And when things get rough in their mind, I got to win a game. So you say, okay, I got to win the game, but you forget about what made us, how did we get the lead? How do right. we get here? moving the basketball, passing it around. So they start to control the ball a little bit more. And now no one's touching the ball. Now we get a lot of guys standing around and they just forget. Right. Like and oh, yeah. and, and, and and Bill and Bill and Stacy can probably speak to this because they played in the league. Like when we look at it sometimes as um, fans or broadcasters or observers, it looks selfish. And in their minds, they're wired to think this is the way I'm going to help my team. Right. And this you know is the way I mean? I've done it my <laughs> right. whole career. <laughs> right. So we're like, oh, it yeah. might look like a bad shot, but they're like, okay, um, maybe I got beat. You know, baseline, back cut, something happened. This is my chance to impact the game instead of thinking, 
my chance to impact the game is doing the things that have got us to this point where maybe we have a lead or could, like, for instance, that's, after, right on, that's, that's what film sessions are for too. hundred to percent. When guys are open. I mean, you, you go back to that, that legendary 1991 finals with, with Michael Jordan was, you know, Phil Jackson said, you know, who's open. And they said, Pax is open. We'll throw him the ball, you know, and, and what happens? He goes out and throws the ball to Pax. Pax hits one of the biggest, you know, uh, jumpers in the history of uh, Chicago Bulls basketball. And sometimes your star players have to be told that. They have to be told that because, they, as you said, in their mind, they feel like I'm attacking and this is what's going to help my team win when the ball's in my hands and i got to make something happen. And most likely it's more on the scoring end instead of making the pass that's going to help your team win the winning plays. And I think that's where – you know, I think that's where the coaching staff has to step up and tell these superstar players, like, hey, if this dude is open, if the guy with the white jersey is five steps ahead of you and he's wide open, throw the ball to him. And if he misses it and, and blows a layup or blows a dunk, that's on him. You made the right basketball play. You made the winning play. Now it's up to the other guy who missed it. That's where you miss Lonzo so much because late game situations with him, he knew how to get everybody involved. He got Booch involved. He knew how to get, you know, Zach more efficient scoring. And, you know, they had to work so hard this year without that point, true point guard. They had to work extremely hard to try to score. It's kind of like the second half of the season last year when Zoe went out and we were more into the isolation plays because that's what we had to do to win. And, and it kind of carried over to this year. I want, I want to jump in because Stacy brought up a good point, film. And I think technology has gotten so good that – we could make a clip of a, an exact s segment that you want to see. So you can pick up Zach Levine with the basketball at the center circle exactly when you want it, and you can show him that clip. I don't know the answer, so I'm, I'm asking a really bad question because, as I know as, as a lawyer, you don't ask a question you don't know <laughs> the answer to. But I have a, a very good idea. When guys are watching film today, are they watching clips or are they watching the game? Because there's a difference. You can watch a clip and just see how you're, suppo you're supposed to do. But when you watch a game, you see the game flow. You see that, oh, we've had two turnovers and two bad shots in a row. We haven't scored in four possessions. We need to work something right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I don't know what's going on with film session because it's close. the NBA is it's close. so hard. To, to get a practice in. I mean, every coach you talk to is like, well, we just don't have time to practice anymore. And today with the load management. A little bit more uh, player friendly. Yes. And you're showing, so you're showing film. And how much film, you know, literally, Phil, I thought Stacy, and I think Stacy will agree, Phil Jackson was great. He made our film sessions fun because he put movie yeah. clips into it. And, and he picked on us. If we made mistakes, he called us out and called everyone out on the team. Now he's a little gentler with, with Michael. You know, he wouldn't, he, wouldn't, he, he wouldn't use Michael's name necessarily, but he, well, Michael he didn't make any mistakes. Did he? <laughs> <laughs> no, but he did. He, you know, he wanted us to pass the ball. He and Michael didn't pass it to someone. He'd say, well, we got to make the, the right pass here. Well, if I made the wrong pass, he goes, Wennington, you got to make the right pass here. So it's, I mean, it, but, it, but he threw in different movies. What about Bob? Uh, <laughs> uh, what was he? What was the military? Full Metal Jacket. Full Metal Jacket. Yes. Full metal jacket, the Wizard of Oz. And, um, and you know, he, yeah, we had a lot of things to illustrate what he was trying to get his point across. Every now and then, someone would make a bonehead play, and you throw a, uh, just an odd clip of like the Three Stooges running around out there doing something. So, <laughs> yeah, but it it made it fun, but engaging, also right? yes, mm -hmm. exactly. That's the word engaging for us to get into it. Where now, Clips. you know, you, you come to a Bulls game before the game, and you see obviously you see the guys come out for two hours before the game. There's certain guys coming out at certain times doing their thing. And then a coach will have an iPad and they'll be going over clips. And what is, but, and that's helpful. I, I, it's wonderful. But when you have a team that we're constantly saying game management is an issue, I think you need to watch a little bit more than just a 30 second clip, maybe a five, a five minute clip of that game where you lost the lead, the momentum changed. And how did it change? Why did it? Yeah. Exactly. And what's funny is this is a team of grown men. Like, we've said this a million times. This is a team where the individuals, you all have a reason to like them. And you all see how they've they've earned their place here. And I do think that Vooch deserves a lot of credit after the season he had last year. I don't want that to get to get lost. 
But then it's like, well, you guys all know what the data says. For example, we have talked about Zach Levine on catch and shoot threes. And mm -hmm. that's what made those last few minutes against Miami so tragic is you don't have to be the dude taking it to the lane. Like, you don't have to be that guy right now. Like, you can be this person. And the numbers say that you are most successful as this person. I, I agree 100%. But then in Zach's mind, he's the guy without the ball. Right. He's not the guy making the decision. And the trust issue, you got to trust everyone that's on the same page. Is Does he trust everyone to make the right play at the right time and do the right thing? So when it comes down to it, we become who we are, and we're going to do and rely on what got us to this moment and time, not necessarily what's been successful that year. Stacey, because the trust issue that you just mentioned, uh, the, 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 the lead ball handler or decision-making role on this team has been uh, DeMar DeRozan for these last couple of years. Uh, and, and I'd be interested to hear, you know, because Stacey's right there on the court. Bill, you're right there on the court. You understand the communications that are happening verbally and non-verbally. Um, did anything in this last month uh, in, in the play-in game against Toronto – Zach's second half, to like, does, does any of that change going into next year because you don't know what the point guard situation is going to be again? Well, I tell you what, I mean, I know, I know Bulls Nation, you know, you look at the tweets and all that. I get, you know, people hit me all the time. Like, you can't run it back. Don't bring this team back. <laughs> and I'm like, listen, what you, what people don't understand uh, about basketball is, is that, you got to get continuity. You you got to have a core group. You look at most of these successful teams; they, their core group has been together a while. Um, I know you get frustrated with the core group the Bulls have, but I mean, you know, look at Boost for instance. You know, as much as we like Boost to post up, how many guys are you gonna find out there that's gonna get you a double double every night rolling out of bed? You, you got to remember that. In my opinion, with Boost. I would like to see him post up more. That's something I think Billy Donovan and the coaching staff needs to put in their offense and say, look, big fella, we know you can shoot the three, but we don't need seven or eight threes shot from you every night. We need you in the post, and we need you to work out, and you're going to get 30 touches in the post every night. And there's going to be nights we want you to get 40. When you plan to get somebody six foot six, oh, you get 40 tonight. I'm telling I'm putting it on the board. Vooch, 40 point night tonight against such and such. They got a six foot six center. You know, and I think that's got to be something they got to come back next year with. But as far as like their core group of guys, you got to keep, I mean, look at Kobe White. Look at the development Kobe White had. You know, everybody, you know, beginning of the season, get rid of Kobe, trade Kobe. Now everybody loves Kobe. That's why you can't give up on the young players that the Bulls have because, you know, look what, look at Lowry Marketing. You know, Lowry Marketing now is a superstar. <laughs> He's a superstar in Utah. It took two years for him to get to that position, but you saw the transition. You know, he had it here in Chicago, you know, his first two years, you know, he was here. And then he lost his confidence under Jim Boylan. And, and I think, you know, that, that hurt him for that year. And then he goes and finds and develops somewhere else. You don't want Patrick Williams to do that because I still am a firm believer. I know a lot of people say, straight screen's crazy. Patrick Williams is going to be a 3 and D guy. He's going to be an elite 3 and D guy. He showed you signs this year that he, this is his first full year playing without any injuries, first year was COVID, didn't have a training camp, didn't have a summer league, really. And now, you know, last year with the broken wrist, he didn't come back to almost the very end of the season. This is really his first full year playing full fully. Uh, he had some ups and downs, but he saw potential in this kid. Um, I think they're going to bring it back. I think I think the key for them, though, I think they got to find a point guard because you don't know Zoe's situation. You got to legitimately get a, a point guard. You got to find some shooters. I mean, if you got to, you know, you got to go grab some, some three-point shooters. That's what they need. They need to get some guys, you know, that can come in and knock down consistent shots. Uh, when these, when, when you have Zach and you have DeMar that demands so much attention defensively, they have to have outlets that guys can step up and make some shots. I think Kobe could be your point guard, to be honest with you. But I don't know if they really, I don't know if they're ready for that yet. I think they probably want to see him another another season coming off the bench, but you never know. I'm not, I'm not there. Yeah. We were having a conversation during the break. And, <laughs> and so we got Bill Winnington here, Jason Goff, Stacey King here in our round table. Bill brought up something that I wanted to ask you about Stacey, because you both went through this at different times in your career. And we were talking about Patrick Williams and him being able to maybe turn that thing, that star thing on. And, and it, it was a raised point of, you know, Patrick was never really the guy. 
And he has to learn now to be the guy at the NBA level. You guys, and, and Bill brought it up, and I agree with Jay, Bill's not giving his college career enough credit. Right. But Bill was the man in high school, and then he had to learn to defer a little bit at St. John's. Stacy was the man in high school, and he was the man in Oklahoma. And then he gets to the NBA and has to defer. So how did you guys learn how to, to play your role? And, and Stacy, I'll start with you. What advice would you give Patrick Williams for him to take to step out of the shadow and say, all right, I am ready to take that next step in my development as a star in this league? See, Patrick's situation is a little bit different than me and Bill's because, like, I know when I came out of Oklahoma, you know, I was a 30-point-a-game scorer. And then I came on a team that won 50 games, and they didn't really need Stacey King. They didn't need B.J. Armstrong. You know, they, they had a great start in five. They were able to build their bench by getting first rounders, you know? So my role coming here was not to be a scorer, but to, to be a defender, to be a rebounder, to run the floor. Uh, so my role is totally different. Patrick's role, he's coming here and they basically saying, we need you to be the guy. Like you can come in and be the guy. You have an opportunity to be the guy. You just got to assert yourself. Patrick is a real quiet, uh, you know, introverted, you know, player. And, and he was that way at Florida state. He was a six man. And this is new to him, you know, and he's playing on a team with, you know, I think DeMar's a future Hall of Famer. I mean, I don't know how everybody else feels about it, but I, I think he's a future Definitely. Hall of Famer with all the things yes. he's accomplished Definitely. in his career and he's not done. Um, you know, you got Vooch, who's an all-star. You got Zach, who's an all-star. You got three older players on that team that are all-star caliber players. And now you're asking a 19, 20, you know, some kid to come out there and say, be the man. We want you to, we want you to step your game up. And he's never had to do that. So it's been really difficult to him. But as I believe also it's a coaching thing too, you know, and I'm not saying, you know, I'm not taking a shot at Billy. I just think that there's certain guys and Phil was really good at this. You know, there's certain guys you can yell at and get on and say, you do it this way and you can, you know, be, you know, be in his, be in his chest and his grill and they will respond. There are other guys that you have to be a little bit more nurturing to. You, you can't yell at them because they'll go into a shell you know, they won't handle it well. You know, we had that in Horace Grant. You know, you, you could you could get more out of Horace Grant if you came at him respectful. If you yelled at Horace Grant, Horace Grant would be, you know, you know, F you, he'd be ready to fight you. And he would lose his whole mental thought process on what he was supposed to do on the court. So they recognize that. And so I think the coaching staff has to recognize that as well with their players. It's like Patrick is one of those guys you have to, you know, it sounds like you're babying him, but no you're getting more out of them when you're saying to him, Patrick, you know what? You're doing a great job. I need, you know, tonight, this is a big night for you. I need you to try to give me 20 and eight and six assists. Boy, if you do that, we got a shot to win. And give them that little encouragement, that energy. When he's out on the floor and he does something wrong, you know, grab him to the side and say, that's okay, shake it off, shake it off. I just need you to come out there. I need you to go, now go get me a bucket. Get that ball off the glass and go get me a bucket. And build his confidence up to the point where he doesn't need you to do it after three or four years. He now believes he's that guy. I, I agree with Stacy 100%, but I think to, in today's game, it's not knowing which guys to, for lack of a better word, coddle and bring along. Sometimes you need to yell at some guys, and I don't think anyone gets yelled at anymore. And I think that that has to happen. And it, it can't be a constant thing. I mean, anyone that has kids or if you're – obviously everyone's been a kid. If you, when your parents are constantly yelling at you, you – You'll tune it out. Yeah, tune it's it out. Counterproductive. It has to be and, – and Phil did that. He didn't – to Stacey's point, Phil knew exactly when to push your buttons. Not every day. I had coaches yelling at you every day and – Trust me, by, by the time training camp, we used to have training camp for three weeks. By the time training camp was over, you weren't listening anymore. It didn't matter to those coaches. And those teams usually didn't do well. But when you push the buttons when you need to, to get someone motivated a little bit, and then they're mad at you, so they play well, and they realize, well, I can do this. I, I've done it. Now Now that confidence starts. Other guys, and he's right, Patrick, you got to pull them along a little bit slower and kind of help them out and get them to do it. And you need to have that almost a good cop, bad cop, where one one guy's going to push your buttons, get you going, but then someone else is there. Hey, all right, you're right. He, he's yeah. right, but yeah. you know you can do this. Yeah, I mean, and you you guys are around it more than I. You know, you, you got somebody on the bench there, Maurice Cheeks, who I always see around Pat, who I always see around Io, or always see around Kobe. It's kind of like he's the guy that brings along with the the more 
gentler ch- touch, right? We mm-hmm. always think of Mo Cheeks at the, the national anthem with the little girl in Portland that time, yeah. one time, right? Mm-hmm. Like that, of course, and being a Hall of Fame point guard and a champion. So there's a wealth of knowledge there. But I'll ask you know everybody this. Um, like, at what point do you believe who he is and then refine from that? Because I, you know, I I put the whole, you know, baby Kawhi thing on him. You sure did. Early. Yeah, I did, man. <laughs> I was like, hey, you got a quiet dude, big hands, that body. You know, let's go. And I'll never forget that young mentioning as well, like, walking up to him and saying, hey, you know, there's, there's a reason why you're the fourth pick in the draft and this team had the fourth pick. There shouldn't be many people eating before you. And like Stacy mentioned, you've had the jagged um, growth plate with the injury and the COVID season and all that other stuff. I can't believe you just said growth plate. Yeah, man, I'm sorry, man. I'm, <laughs> I'm learning. I'm, I'm growing as a human. <laughs> don't laugh, Stacy. Don't laugh. <laughs> no, 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 don't you start getting Stacy to laugh out here. But I'm just saying, man. It's just you know, you. I stopped thinking that about Patrick maybe halfway through the year and then all of a sudden you get to you, once you recalibrate those expectations I was getting surprised more than I was getting disappointed and I think that's I think that's where I'm at with Patrick Williams that yeah we see those flashes and we see those moments but uh you know if they happen more consistently cool but if not you know I think we should start to kind of recalibrate what he is expected to be I guess it was what we were expecting of him yeah. And, and I feel like yeah, let, him, let a, him grow. There was a point in the season, especially before this season, where people were basically asking him to fill every gap the team had. And that's how I felt the expectation was for him. And I'm like, we don't know who he is yet. Like, <laughs> we accepted everybody else. We can't expect him to be that dude. But you do expect results, though, when you see that frame and that, you know, that he, because he's got I an agree. aptitude for the game where, yes. like, he does certain things where it's like, oh, okay, there it is. You know, and you'll hear Bill or you'll hear Stacy, like, you'll hear them get excited as dudes who understand and watch a lot of basketball. I, when I'm those here things for happen. every <laughs> miss dunk by Patrick Williams. Yeah. I'm like, here for every time like, he I wants want, to try to I put some bad the rim. shots out of him in a game where it's like, okay, now you can kind of okay refine that now this is where those shots are because i'll ask y'all like where do you think patrick williams offense is coming from when he's on the court on a game-to-game basis well uh, here, here's the thing I, like i always compare players like i like to say who they're comparable to i i would say patrick is a little bit of Kawhi and a little bit of jeff green and that would be somewhere in between those two players when he's you gotta know, he they don't run plays for Patrick Williams. When when have you ever seen a play? Bill Bill's there. When do you ever see we're gonna say Hawk four or Hawk three or some play that, that, that says for Patrick Williams to go isolation? You don't see any of that. Go back to that playoff last year in Milwaukee when the Bulls put a little wrinkle in the playoff the pick and roll game. They ran a pick and roll between uh Vooch and Patrick Williams, and they were killing Milwaukee with that. Because now Giannis has to switch on Vuce, who rolls to the post. And then you got a bigger Brooke Lopez having to guard, you know, uh, Patrick Williams. And, they, speed, and the yeah. Bulls destroyed that. They destroyed that. That's the reason why they won. That's the reason why they won game two, because they had no answer for that. If you look at Patrick's numbers in that playoff, that, to me, I felt was a starting point. That Minnesota game when the starters were out and he yeah. scored like 30-some points. And then he carried that over to the playoffs. And I think that first game, he was a little shaky. But after game after game one, he started picking it up. He was probably arguably one of the Bulls' best players in that playoff series against Milwaukee. And I thought this year he was going to catapult to the end. And we saw flashes. Mm-hmm. We saw flashes. But he's a guy you need to run plays for. He's a guy that you got to give him some offense and say, okay, we're going to hawk this ball down. We're going to run a pick and roll. Whatever you need to do to get him the ball, you got to run some plays for him. Uh, let him take the ball off the glass. He's got guard skills. He can hand the ball. He makes good decisions. How many times have you seen Patrick get the ball off the glass? And even Kobe and some of these other kids that can dribble. Two dribbles and they look for either Zach or DeMar, which slows your breakdown. It gives you no kind of continuity on the break, which when you look at this team, they should have more fast breaks. Their goal every night should be anywhere between 15 and 25 points in transition. I need them to be empowered, though, Stacey. I need them to be empowered. Like Kobe White this last month seemed like he was empowered by not only himself but his teammates and the coaching staff as well. 
Like, I need these young dudes to be like, hey, you don't have to defer every single time because maybe that's part of the reason why we're 40 and 42 as a franchise. And, and, Jay- and you know what, Jason? I agree with you 100% because that's what I always say all the time. I, I, when I talk to Patrick, I talk to a lot of these young kids, and I'll just say, man, play your game. You know, don't wait for someone to do it for you. Go do what you do, and then everyone else will follow. But it's easier for us to say that not knowing sure. what the system is dictating for them to do. You know what I'm saying? It's easy for us to say, be the armchair point guard and say, oh, yeah, get off the glass, start the fast break, and go coast to coast, when maybe they're being told to do something totally different and they're following the game plan. Because if you watch when, when they, you know, they, they have boots in the post, for instance. It could be Kobe, it could be Io, it could be any of the younger players. And they got a switch in the post which automatically tells you now the play is broken. We, we don't care what the play is. The mismatch is where we want it right now. We got Vooch being guarded by Javon Carter in the post. That's an obvious mismatch. Throw the ball in there. The younger players will look at it and go, uh, uh, I can't get it in. I'm going to swing the ball now. Now we've lost the momentum. We've lost the mismatch. And now we, you know, we're going to probably settle for you know, a, a long jump shot, and we got nothing out of that possession. And that's where I think the young players have to get better. They have to have confidence that they can read defenses and read situations. And sometimes the play dictates to be broken, and you got to break the play. What does this Bulls team need? If if, uh, if, if I were making you the person <laughs> that could that that could that could go to Arturis and say, "Hey, man, <laughs> this is what hey, you man. need." Well, at the trade deadline, Luke Kennard. That, that was a man. That man was shooting lasers, and then got to Memphis and didn't stop shooting lasers. Um, they uh, they need somebody who is like Patrick Beverly. They need a couple of those guys, maybe. Right. Where, you know, like a college snatcher kind of vibe, because as as great a guys as Zach and DeMar are, they, they are quiet leaders. Right. And sometimes you need guys and put a little professional discomfort. <laughs> and I think when what we saw out of this team, not because Patrick Beverly was going out there and putting up crazy numbers, but, you know, there was a, a kind of a. A first date face kind of vibe where it was like, all right, let's show this dude that this this group is, you know, not what people may think it is. Also, point guard situation has to be handled or addressed. And I'd love a uh, uh, like a power forward who can bang but also shoot like this. There's, there's a lot of things that they 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 need, I think, because there's teams behind them that are coming up in these next couple of years in Orlando and Detroit and squads like that, and then the teams like the Knicks and the, the Hawks and the Cavs, who you were supposed to be in that fray with, that are going to go out and make moves. So there, there's a few things, but how much movement can you really have with 11 guys who are going to be on this team that are currently on the squad right now? Like, who are the people that are really going to move around for those moves to be made? Well, I can only go by what I've heard, and I listen to a little bit of what uh, AK was saying yesterday and he alluded to a lot but you got to read between the lines you know he, he said you know we got to address shooting you need another you, you need another shooter you need some At someone to consistently one. yes so that's a big thing you got to have guys that can spread the floor with the offense that everyone's playing right now he also alluded to shot attempts and you know in the plans the bulls averaged 84 shots a game you got to get more shots than that. Yep. And how do you do that? So now your style of play changes. So if you read into that, what does that mean? Are we still playing DeMar and Zach one-on-one? Because that's 20 of your 24-second clock. And if you're using that much time in a 24-second clock, less shots. You're, you're less shots. So I'm reading into it. I don't know. It, it, but that's a way to fix that. you got to play with more pace. you got to c- come down and get better shots quicker. So that's part of it. So, and then you talk about, you know, it points in the paint that the Bulls are giving up. You got to be able to protect the paint. Now, I know a lot of that is defensive rotations. And I thought uh, in Toronto and in Miami for a little bit, they were doing well, where when they run a high screen roll between two and five or one and five, and Vooch has to help, someone got down low and picked up his man in a timely manner so he didn't already have the ball and be able to just lay it in or get fouled. Most of the time. And at the end of the game, it, that failed But in Miami. But a lot of that also has to do with guys that can maybe not have to switch all the time on that high screen roll. Maybe could show, recover. Like, and, I mean, there's so much switching going on. Everyone rotates now. It's 
that's just the way it is. And back when Stacey and I played, we mixed it up. We didn't switch all the time. We showed and recovered. We let the guy go through. We played under. But everyone's so afraid about everyone's one-on-one defense now. They we we got to rotate and switch all the time. So it it befuddles my mind that you have a guy that maybe is not a good one-on-one defender, but now you're asking him to defend four guys at the same time mm-hmm. and know which way to go at the right time. But that's just the way it's played right now. Everyone's doing that. So we have we have to get that rim protector guy in there. So that that's that's a guy I, t- I think like Patrick Williams that can be that guy. Another guy that can do that athletically and be maybe off the ball defender that can come over and help out when we do get beat occasionally. Stacy. Well, I, I think you got a rim protection and Andre Drummond. You just got to play him. I mean, you know, you go to that Miami game. I, I thought he made a huge difference in that game. Offensive rebounds. Uh, you know, he, he switches out, he gets steals. He averages about a steal a game uh, on those switches. I mean, you just got to find more minutes for him and, and hopefully he's back next year. Um, point guard, definitely, you know, because you don't know, like I said, you don't know Zoe's situation. Um, you definitely need a point guard. And, and I, I I really think Kobe's the point guard. I just think you got to give him the keys to the car. And uh, and then if you do that, then you can go get – maybe go get a shooter. You know, you don't have to spend money to go get a point guard. Uh, maybe you get a point guard, you know, that's not so expensive off the bench because um, there's a ton of talented players in the NBA that are on the bench right now and that you don't have to spend. You can probably go trade for a bag of Doritos for. Um, you don't have to go over the cap to get those guys. But, um, you know, if they're going to run back this team, you know, you gotta you got to address the shooting because that's, you know, that's been a major issue. And I think the shooting gets better if, you know, you definitely have a three-point shooter. You know, everybody's talking about Duncan Robinson, but, you know, you worry about the, the contract, how much money is on that contract. I mean, hey, look. You know, I mean, shooters come at a price now. You know, this is this is a league where shooters are, you know, you're going to have to pay a lot of money for shooters. And, you know, that's that's an option that could be out there for them. Um, I think, you know, I'm a big believer, as Bill said, like, you know, we come from the old school, man. I hate switching defense. I said this the other day on Twitter. I hate switching defense in this era. I think it puts your teams in complete mismatches every single time down the floor. Make guys, Make guys guard people. Get up and guard your man. Play tough. Play physical. Get up and guard your man. And then if we need to switch certain things, we can switch in certain situations, but not every single time down the floor because, you know, when we played, and I hate to be the guy like we always say, get off my lawn guy, get off my lawn, but I am that guy. Um, When you switch, you know, we switch because, you know, you had to be the same size player. You know, if me and Bill switch, we're the same size guys, four and five. You know, if Michael and Scotty switch, it's two, three. You didn't switch one fives. You didn't switch two fives. You just didn't do that because those were mismatches. And I, I, I think that, you know, defensively, even though they got better at the end, I think the switching, you know, if they can really correct that a little bit and then get out and play a little bit more faster where they can get more shots. Because how do you get more shots? Transition. You know, people get more opportunities. You don't get a lot of shots when you come down and you just run a half court game, as Bill said, and it's just you know you know a couple couple of passes get up a shot. You know you got to move the ball, you got to get in transition, get some easier baskets, and more people have to get more shots. You know two or three guys can't demand all the shots. You know your top three players are getting twenty plus shots, and then guys like Patrick Williams getting six, Kobe getting five. It's got to balance out a little bit more, get some more production from those other guys in your in your lineup, and you got a chance to be very good. Stacey, I just have one more quick question for you. If DeMar DeRozan is from the West Coast and he has a hat that's black on with an L and an A locking underneath, what do you think that hat is? <laughs> Let me tell you something, okay? You you know what? I'm a, I'm gonna bring out. you to Law, you know, Layla. I'm gonna bring you to Law, okay? L.A. I'm gonna bring you to the to the small L.A. where I'm from, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring you to all my spots, and I'm gonna let you see all the people walking around with L.A. hats on. You're gonna be like, Stacy was telling the truth about that air. It is Law area. That's what it stands for. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. You couldn't wait to get to the end of the show. <laughs> <laughs> you and Will Purdue. You and Will Purdue yeah. must work together because Will did, Will does that on the pregame show. Snipers. He waits like the last second before me and Adam can't say anything and then he hits us with a little stinger and then we go off air. I said, well, Will's a little sneaky little sucker. So now what we do is we get our jabs on Will early so so it lasts longer. Okay, okay. I'll learn how to take the body blows. And yeah. then after we go to Lawton, we can hang on over in Denton too. We'll just go down the street an hour and a half. Sounds like a great time. Hey, well, Southern yeah. Oklahoma <laughs> North Texas party. Let's, Let's go. It. You let me know. You let me know because, you know, when I come back to Oklahoma, I'm like the governor. Right. So, you know, I, they set it out for me. So you want to 
You know, right now, right now, I'm on my private jet. You know, we're going to board board right now. Stacey, if I, it's if it's I, it's I it's gave me this great satellite phone, I can talk to you here, baby. It's time to go. Oh, oh, look at this water. Oh, I see a little white dolphin. Oh, we out here, board board, baby. I'm getting the suntan, baby. I miss y'all. We miss you too, Stacey. Enjoy the would, off season. If I lived in Oklahoma, I would vote for Stacey. Yeah, yeah. I, I, oh, I, I agree. Not even a question. This is another state that needs to be. Why, hey, why you? Why you? Hey, why y'all playing? I should have ran for the mayor of Chicago. Oh, oh, it's, oh, it's time for us to go. Yeah, stop show, baby. We gotta talk about that later. <laughs> that is Stacey King. <laughs> thanks to him. Thanks to Bill <laughs> Winnington. Thanks to you, Jason Goff. Blame for Layla. An excellent round table. I'm Layla not sorry. For this. I'm Blame not Layla. sorry. I thought she was gonna go Robert Ori there. I, I, yeah, it was a switch yeah, up with the LA Maxwell on you. That, that's, that's, what she did. that's what she did. <laughs> Mad Max. Hey, I hit Jason You still on the phone? I get off. I went Jason Bourne. Hey, don't leave the don't leave the door open because I'll bust it off. All right, <laughs> we'll fight you with a book just right like now. Jason Bourne. Oh. I love the idea of Stacy just being there as the alms budsman, just like jumping God. back in whenever he wants. And it's gonna to happen two hours from now, Stacy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still here. I'm talking to my stewardess right now. I'm talking to my stewardess. Excuse me, can you bring me some uh, a mimosa, please? Thank you. I'm, 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 I'm going.